Hello and welcome to Using Options as a Stock Investor. My name is James Boyd. Today's date, November 14th. We welcome you here today. We also got many of you uh, with us. We'd like to welcome Crispy, Dragon Rider 108, Dom, Mark, Lou, BJ, David, and many others. Good morning to you. Boy, a lot to talk about today. We had some data on CPI this morning that was a little cooler than expected. And boy, the market liked it. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, as we, as we get started, remember this class is called Using Options as a Stock Investor. So the foundation would be, or the premise would be, that the investor has a stock portfolio or is trying to build one. Uh, it could be dividends, it could be gross stocks, et cetera. It could be uh, momentum stocks, all of the above. We tend to focus really on relative strength, okay? So that could be in any of those areas of dividend or income, value or growth. We don't have a preference. Show us relative strength. That's what we're going to focus on. When we say relative strength, we're talking about stock having a stronger performance than the index, the sector, and or industry group. So quick heads up there. Now, as we get started, uh, remember that we do post educational content on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, and also Cameron, who is in chat, and myself. You can find us by our, just simply our first name, last name, CS. So check that out. Now, also, as we get started, remember, if you have questions, just know that Cameron May, a fellow instructor, is in the chat. He'll be watching those chats. I will as well. And uh, if you have questions, just go ahead and ask. Okay. Now, also remember that uh, re when we talk about investing and options, uh, options carry a high level of risk, not suitable for all investors. When we talk about examples of technical analysis, there are other approaches including fundamental analysis that may assert some different views. Also, we will be using the paper money software application for educational purposes only. Also remember that investing involves risk and including loss of principal. And also remember when we talk about examples, they are just that, they are not recommendations. We'll take a quick look at the market conditions and boy, there's a lot to talk about there. We'll talk about some strategies as we look at some examples. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna illustrate those strategies using the paper money account. So let's go ahead and just hop right in. So first off, I gotta start with the Russell. I don't normally talk about the Russell, but it was so huge, it's hard not to talk about, okay? Now, Krishna, Ron, Eddie, is anybody seeing a potential pattern on this index here? Any takers on that? Now, if we were to draw, like I say, a pattern on the Russell, we might say in this case, maybe as that starting kind of form, you kind of have like a, there's, a, let me kind of, let's play, let's play Pictionary, okay? Or where I draw, I'm not sure if it's Pictionary, it's been a long time, where I draw and then you try to guess what I'm drawing. Any takers so far? Go ahead and type that in. We run back up and then we pull back and then what we're going to see is kind of this little arch. And that really looks like an inverse head and shoulder, okay? Labels head, shoulder, with a neckline probably right about, let's say, 1,800. Now, we're up 4.67% in a blasted morning, for crying out loud. Now, when we're talking about the Russell, we cannot trade, let's say, the, the blank product, you fill in the blank, okay, for the Russell. We can do the index. And when we talk about the index, we might consider, let's say, a long call vertical, an LCV, or a short put vertical. Now, we don't need a 45-minute class on why would you choose one versus the other, because it's really simple. When you look at both these verticals, it's a not, it, we don't really have a difference on gamma. Uh, we don't really have a difference on vega. If someone actually thinks there's more upside, they would actually want to have a higher potential upside potential, they would pick a long call vertical. If someone said, look, I want income, but it's not going to be as high as a long call vertical upside potential gain, and they want a lower break even, they would pick the short put vertical. Those two are both bullish strategies. And so the, really the biggest thing there is, if they said, hey, I'm more bullish and I want a higher potential upside, they would come in and say, I'm going to pick a long call vertical, okay? If you said, I'm not really sure about the upside, I like the credit, 
I want a lower break even. Let me repeat what I just said. They'd pick a short put vertical. Okay, now that I explained that twice, which one would you pick? Long call vertical, you want more potential upside, higher break even. And or would you pick, let's say, a short put vertical, give me a credit, lower the break even. I know it's not going to make as much money as a long call vertical. What would you choose? Well, if we take a look at this, okay, let's say the investor said, James, I want that long call vertical. I want to go for that upside. Okay, well, let's go look at the, let's kind of go look and see if the spreads are tight. What do those options look like? And if we take a look at this, okay, so uh, Kevin says a short put vertical. Gary says a short put vertical. BJ, long call vertical. LOL. Okay, we're going to go out to the 15th of December. And what we're going to do is we got calls on the left, puts on the right. We're going to go look and see what does the spread look like. You got about four, you got about 70 cents on the bid ass spread on the call side. On here, the 1775s, about 70 cents. Okay. So when we're playing something higher price, that's not unusual. Let's just double check the volume in the open interest just real quick. The volume, a couple hundred traded so far this morning. When we look at the open interest, let's just double check that. Okay. 3,300. We're going to stay in this one. The 1780, we're going to buy that over the 1775. We're trying to see where there's more liquidity. Now, you said, I don't know what the open interest is. The open interest is that's the number of contracts that are open and still unexercised. When we talk about the volume, that is today, okay? That could be people that bought contracts and or sold contracts. They are not netted off. This is the activity to open positions, okay? Now, what I'm now going to see in this case is we're going to right-click on that, ask price. We're going to go to where it says buy. We're going to go right to where it says vertical. So, so here's the deal. A lot of times when people see the market, they think we have to pick stocks all the time. It's not true. You can pick the index. You can pick the sector. We said that's kind of almost potentially trade number one. We're picking a basket, not an individual stock. Now, there's reasons to do a basket, okay? like an index, et cetera, or a sector. We're going to go buy vertical, okay? Now, I need you to also kind of note this, that this is an AM expiration. It's not PM. So this is Friday morning, okay? Friday morning, the 15th of December, and it's not going to necessarily be the opening print of the Russell. You got to wait for all those Russell 2000 stocks to open, which might take some time to see where to settle. We're not going to wait all the way until that point anyway, but that you just need to understand that. We're going to choose, we'll position size in just a moment, when we look at the debit. The debit, what are we paying? What do we have a right to buy it at? 1780 is where we have a right to buy it at, plus 270. And now we see a break even. Break even, survey says, 1782.70. Where's the price now? 1785. We just need the Russell to stay where it is right now to break even. But where do we get the maximum gain? We get the maximum gain when that price closes above both strikes. Okay. So whatever the debit is, well, that's what we can lose. Check. Given a vertical, five dollar wide spread, 1780, 1785, five dollars less what we're paying, 270. And that's where that max profit is coming in, okay? So in this type of trade, is it really about time decay? No, it's not. Is it about volatility? No, it's not. It is a, a bullish position. It is, okay? It's positive delta. If we want to just look at this on the Analyze tab so we can see the Greeks for just a moment, let's take a quick peek at this and see what we have here. And remember, if we take a look at this and we show the price slices, what is the delta of the position given one contract? Which option Greek? Delta, gamma, theta, vega. Which option Greek is the biggest? It's, it's delta. So we're focusing on direction, okay? Now, do we have to do something like a $5 wide spread? Well, it kind of comes back to how much can you risk? If we said in this portfolio we could risk $1,000, well, we would probably widen out this spread. We want to check and see what the liquidity is, though. 
If we were going to widen that out, do not assume, okay? If we looked at kind of widening this out and said, okay, does the 1790s have a better bid ass spread, better 70 cents? They're about the same ish, but there's a lot more open interest here. So we're going to open this up to the 1790. The idea behind that was we were going to do multiple contracts anyway. So if I look at this now, we're going to see that this will now change to there's the debit given a $10 wide spread. And we know the max gain is 450. Same math as before. There it is. Break even didn't really change that much. There's max profit. Now, let's make an assumption here that in the paid money portfolio, we could risk $1,000. Matter of fact, let's just say for right now, we could risk $1,500 in the bigger account. We would be doing two contracts. Now, we'll come to the portfolios in just a sec. We're going to do two contracts of the Russell, okay? What's the most we could lose given the vertical? $1,100. Note that on this, it's not only the commission, but they tack on a little 48 cent fee because there's an equity and option exchange fee. Not backbreaking, but just note that as well. Max profit, 900. Now, here's the deal. We're gonna send that order. We're gonna go back and we're gonna take a look at the position. Now, if we're kind of talking about maybe what we call path of least resistance, what does that even mean? Well, if you break a level of resistance, where might it try to go to? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click on this line, Edit Properties. I'm going to make that line a little thicker, if you don't mind, maybe kind of make a little highway strip. And I'm also going to make it where it show the price so that way you can see it. And if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of make it like an orange line. No, let's not go orange. Let's go, uh, let's go blue, okay? And now when we draw a line, we can see that level. Now, if we were to break this 1775, Probably some levels that we might be looking for. Could it go to? I didn't save it as a default, so I'll have to fix that. Let me just go back, do what I did, but then I save it as a default because I didn't do that. There we go. Save as default now. Now when I draw the line, it should do it. So let's, there we go. So now if I draw another one. So if I was going to kind of think that, hey, if it broke to the upside, what might be some pass of resistance levels it could hit? 1843, 1913. Trade number one here today is on the Russell. Now, if you follow me all year long, you know we don't trade with Russell very often, okay? I think that's a price pattern that could be setting up. And I'm also gonna go back to kind of a chart that we saw today that might be quite helpful to get the small caps to maybe buoy back up. Now, for all this year, we've been dealing with interest rates rising. With some of that CPI data today being softer than expected, not as hot, we saw that the TNX, which is the 10-year rate, you could look at the TYX, the 30-year rate, both of them dropped pretty substantially. And so that's kind of why we're doing also tr trade number one of the Russell, okay? Long the Russell. And the other thing that we kind of want to also try to focus on is what is the likelihood of the NASDAQ breaking to all-time highs. And so listen to this comment, okay? We saw before that on the NASDAQ, we got pressed and fell down below the horizontal support level. It did, okay? How many of you have seen this type of pattern where we break down below a support level only to rocket ship back up and make a new high? So when we see this, when buyers come in below support, that is typically viewed as a very, 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 very bullish signal. Does that mean it's guaranteed to go up? No. But if you see buyers come in below support, the chances of taking out this high is probably increasingly higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. So trade number one was Russell. Trade number two, or focus number two, is going to be going long the NASDAQ stocks, okay? So when we look at the NASDAQ, we're going to go to Market Watch. We're going to go to where it says Visualize. Okay, now people think, well, i got to come up with some NASDAQ stock, okay? No, you don't. We're going to go to Market Watch. We're going to go to Indices, 
and we're going to click on the NASDAQ 100. So the stocks that really have a bigger box, they matter more. So if we were looking at the kind of the stocks, which ones might be driving performance of the NASDAQ, we could go look at Microsoft. We could look at NVIDIA. We could look at Meta. We could look at Google. We could look at Amazon. We could look at Tesla, which we did yesterday. Okay, so here's the point. Stop thinking that you got to find some secret hot sauce. Why don't you go look at some of the bigger ones that can drive performance, whether they're market cap or price weighted, okay? Understand what drives the index and go look at those, okay? Now, I'm, now let me just see real quick. LD, Eva, Michelle, BJ, AP514. If I said, choose one of them or choose two of them, which one are you seeing in the NASDAQ that we could maybe look at as a trade example that might be bouncing off support, back up, falling back down, bouncing back up in an uptrend, and or a stock that could be breaking out of resistance? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Okay, Mike, okay, comment from actually many was Microsoft. Now, we already bought Microsoft in the fundamental class, and that has been a horse. Okay, very nice. That was one that was outperforming Microsoft, uh, outperforming Apple, and we chose Microsoft over Apple, which for some people hurt, kind of hurt their feelings. Now, the other one is that I'm seeing there is Amazon. Is Amazon something that is bouncing off support and or breaking out of resistance? Is there any potential price pattern on this chart? Well, you kind of see like a big cup here, okay? So if I were to kind of draw this back down, kind of see where it went flat, and then it went up, not much of a pullback, okay? Now, some people will say, well, I would like a deeper pullback. You know what? Maybe other people don't. Okay. <laughs> maybe you want a deeper pullback, but maybe other people are saying, oh, forget it. Okay. So if we looked at this, this is kind of like what we call the cup or the bowl. And that right there is what we would call the handle. Okay. If we look at this base, we're, let's just say it's 125. And let's just say the area of resistance is about 145. That give us about twenty dollars from resistance down to the base. So if we add twenty dollars as far as a potential upside gain, that's really going to be about one sixty five. Now, what was the class on last week? Okay, what was the class on last week? And I think that sometimes when we come to class, we might think, "Well, I I need a new strategy." I don't think you need a new strategy. I think maybe just kind of practicing the strategy. Last week, we had a class on cash secured pets, okay? Now, remember in our class, we try to have a nucleus of stocks. And we're going to talk about those here today. On the outside of that is what we call a feeder. If we buy the stock itself, sure, it's more capital intensive. It's more directional. It's more sensitive to direction. It could be dividend paying, sure. But on the outside of stocks, it's cash secure puts, which is an income strategy and also might feed into our stock portfolio. Ding, 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 ding. You get it? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, what, what strike, what area would you be comfortable in paper money to buy the shares of Amazon? So if you said, James, I like to buy the shares of Amazon at 140. Is, is that what you're thinking? Okay. Are you saying, James, I would like, I'd like to feel more comfortable. I, I feel comfortable to buy the shares at 145. Okay. Now let's use what we did last week. Let's use what we did last week. Why would someone pick a 140 versus a 145? We know that answer. We know before we even look at the strikes, the 140 is going to have a lower premium because there's less chance of the stock being below the strike. We already know that. We don't even need to look at the table. If we sell the 145, why would sell, someone sell the 145? They're saying, I'm okay with being the buyer of the shares. I know the premium is going to be bigger too because there's a greater chance for the stock to be below that strike price. If someone says, no, I, I was kind of thinking, I would 
not, let me kind of draw this out, okay? If you're thinking to do something like out of the money, like the 140, okay? You are saying that you really want more of the premium and not as much the chances of stock ownership, okay? You're really saying my focus is premium, not as much stock. You still have the chance to be a sign, but you're saying I would just really like more of the income potential. If you're really saying, you know what, James, I'm going to sell the 145, which is kind of close. It's out of the money, but it's also very close to being at the money in terms of the strike. Well, there it's about the premium, all this label as P plus S. P for the premium, S for the stock. And this is really about the income plus stock. Now, if you said, James, I'm really more of an income person, then that investor might sell the 140. If you said, no, I, I'll take the income and I don't really mind in buying the shares of the stock, that investor might choose the 145. Now, when we talked about this strategy last week, just seeing more application of it, 20 to 50 days to expiration, and we start with the monthly options where there tends to be more liquidity so let's go to work now so what we're going to do is we're going to go right back to that trade tab we're going to go to the december expiration we just talked through it we have a bigger premium surprise not really okay and we look at the 140 there's still some premium but it's not as much as we saw before now on the 145 now, some investors like to look at this in terms of what's called an ROR. That's simply short for what we call return on risk. You can think of this as just taking the option premium divided by the current stock price, 2.42. And you're going to see that the option premium divided by the current stock price is about 1.3. The reason why we look at the percentages, some investors like to see a certain minimal acceptable threshold, okay? Because they're taking on potential risk, they're setting aside uh, stock ownership, they're all, and by the way, they also have risk to volatility expansion, stock price going down, they're paying a commission, et cetera. They wanna make sure, are they at least being, well, having some offset to that risk in terms of getting enough credit? We're gonna kind of play the devil's advocate of saying, I wanna get the premium and we do not mind in owning the shares. Now, this is where we need to have some like forethought. Hey, if we were assigned to buy the shares of the stock, how much would it be? Well, if we did one contract and we were assigned to buy a hundred shares of stock at 145, how much would that be? be $14,500. Well, if you look up at this account balance, you're going to see that that would be about 10% of the account balance, no more, okay? Now, so that would be like, we would be up to our eyeballs in terms of one position, okay? Let me just tell you something. You can absolutely set yourself back two to three years by over position sizing. It's not only the financial loss, it's the loss of confidence, which sometimes can be as bad as the financial loss. So if this position were going to go down, we want there to really be a kind of a cap of how much this position represents of the portfolio. That way, if this position goes down, it does not become so emotional for us. It can become more emotional when there's a bigger percentage of the portfolio in one position. Now, you might say, I already know that. Well, I just want to make sure for others who don't, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to confirm and send. There's the credit. There's the max loss. Assuming the stock goes to zero, break even, strike price minus premium, and there's what you're going to see is the credit less the commission of 65 cents, okay? Now, <laughs> Now, Jay says, what? No rule, uh, no ruler to smack the hand. I don't have a ruler. 
I could go get one, okay? But here's the thing. A lot of times it's not the market. It's the guy or the gal that was doing the market that breaks rule and then blames the market. Okay, there you go. There you go. Okay, so we're gonna send the order. Fills. Okay, now remember, when we talk about selling a put, it, is it a bullish strategy? Absolutely it is. What do we wanna do? We wanna sell when the premium is high. We wanna buy that option back when it's low and try to make the difference. We really got about 31 days to see what's going to happen with the trade. Once we get inside 10 days until expiration, no more, no less than four days, we are looking to exit or take assignment of the shares of the stock. Okay. Now, let me kind of just kind of go around for just a sec, see where the Dow is. Dow is sitting here at 556 points. Now, we always talk about sometimes the Dow crash lower. Well, here we're seeing a crash higher. How many of you would like to see a crash higher? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, okay. Hey, easy. Only one hand at a time, okay? So Dow, 556. Good grief, okay? When you look at the S&P, 90 points higher. Hello, as Bill would say, doink, okay? By the way, that's a, a pretty nice little pinch there, up. I also want you to kind of notice that V formation that we kind of talked about. When you see that stocks go up as fast as they went down, that becomes an increasing likelihood of taking out that prior high. We've been talking about that, and that's what we've done pretty much all bullish trades. Well, I, we haven't done a single bearish trade the whole last week and a half uh, for that reason. And so if we take a look at this, what you're going to notice is we're not that far off of this high. And we are not that far off of the 4,600, the all-time high. The one that we have to kind of go back to and at least mention is really this, the NASDAQ. How many points are we off? Let's see, what, 100, about 135 points until a brand new high? So let's just kind of cap this, kind of just go back to something just real quick. I want to make sure you're grabbing what we're saying, okay? So number one is the Russell example trade. Okay, and this one kind of had that inverse head and shoulder. And the thesis behind this trade is TNX flat to down. Could the Russell start to, let's say, buoy back as those companies in the small caps, could they bounce back as the cost of financing becomes a little less? Okay, and the outlook of the rate rising comes a little bit less. Could that help the small caps? That's number one. Number two is really kind of trying to be NASDAQ focused. Now, that doesn't mean you have to, but the paper money accounts are going to be. NASDAQ focused in terms of the index and stocks that make up a large portion of the NASDAQ. And that would be example given, like we saw, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Meta, you name it. Now, before we go look at kind of another, so those are kind of two major themes to take away. Now, the other thing in my web guy actually kind of take away from this is if we're probably NASDAQ focused, NASDAQ, the small caps were really playing for the idea that the rates were flatline. We're really focused on the NASDAQ. If we say focus on the NASDAQ, we probably still have to be kind of more potentially bullish, discretionary stocks, question mark. Because if we see the NASDAQ rise, okay, there's a really good chance that the discretionary stocks and or the sector rise. Now, want to kind of go back to just one thing just briefly. If you have not kind of caught this, uh, last week on Monday, we kind of re uh, we started over on the new YouTube channel, okay? Well, up until that time, we were trading two portfolios. Let me kind of give you a sense of where they are and then what we're doing. Uh, so first off, when we look at the margin account, we started out on December 20th of last year at 65000 That margin account as of this morning was at 
And if we look at the year-to-date return so far, it was at 70.7% year-to-date. So when you come to this class, you're not going to see me just kind of saying, hey, this is what this XYZ strategy is. We are trading strategies. We are creating focus and then tracking those returns over time and then comparing them to the index of the S&P 500. Now, the S&P 500 performance year to date was at 13% year to date, okay? And the IRA was this morning at 406,700, which is at a new time high as well for that. And that portfolio started at 325,000, okay? So if we look at that and kind of say, where was that? It's at 25.1%. Now, what's kind of interesting, that's year to date, the I, the margin account, as we have to kind of go back to work here, the, the margin account had $60,000 in cash, which kind of is why we're doing kind of trades here today, that we could use quite a bit of cash. The IRA, and this is not unusual, the IRA had $235,000 in cash. So, by the way, if you kind of said, look, on average, how much do you think you were investing in the IRA? I bet we were only investing 50% of the capital and half was sitting in cash. So even though we were investing half in and the other half was sitting in cash, it was still able so far to outpace the S&P, okay? Now, let's kind of just take kind of some inventory. What are we really doing? We are trying to find relative strength, okay? If we try to find things that have relative strength, we are looking for prices to be above 10-day moving average. We do not have any biases. We could, if it was if it was dividend stocks, wonderful. If it was value examples, wonderful. If it was if it was growth examples, wonderful. We love the things that have relative strength compared to the indexes or sectors. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the stocks, cash secured puts, short put verticals, covered calls, long call verticals. Those four main strategies to drive performance. It's really what it comes down to, okay? Now, let's kind of go back to work. One of the other stocks I want to kind of bring up for just a second is Meta, okay? Now, Meta, and I kind of just want to bring this up for just a moment. Meta, so I want to kind of go back to the kind of idea, long call vertical versus short put vertical. Remember what we said before. If you want higher upside dollars, pick a long call vertical. If you said, look, I want an income with a lower break even, I want a greater chance to be right. Put vertical. Class over. Have a nice day. That's really what it comes down to. Because when you look at one uh, vertical versus the other, they're both about the same on Delta. Vega is not much of a different either. Okay, we'll bring this up. Let's kind of show this. So in the previous class, we kind of added 50 shares of stock. So note that, check, check, okay? Let's kind of compare and contrast these. If we were going to do like a long call vertical, 335, 340, click, 335, 340, there it is. Remember what we said before. If we go like something at the money on the call side, it's going to be about a one-to-one, -one. 250 loss, 250 potential gain. We can see that right there. Here it is. Not surprising. Same as before. Okay. Now, let me do this. We're going to analyze this trade. Let's bring it up side by side so that way you can see it. So, of the Greeks, Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, which of these four Greeks is the biggest? It's not even close. It's Delta. If the Delta is the biggest, you know you're playing direction. If the Delta is positive, you know you're in a bullish type of strategy. That is the long call vertical. But what about a short put vertical, which is what we're going to choose? So if I looked at this short put vertical, and I'm going to pick the pretty much the exact same strike, sell the 335, buy the 330. Let's look and see what it does. Well, if we were to do that, one contract a piece so we can compare apple to apple, 
You're now going to see that if we bring this up, okay, you got a 215 uh, max profit, 285 max loss. Let's kind of look and see the difference. Well, if we bring this up and say, let's analyze this, and now let's kind of show apple to apple, okay? Now, we already saw the long call vertical. Let me kind of just remind you. There's the long call vertical, Delta. There's the Greeks, okay? Let's now isolate just the short put vertical. Does the Delta change that much? No. Gamma change that much? No. Theta change that much? No. Vega, a little bit more negative, but not an atrocity, okay? Let me go back and look at this for just a second. Long call vertical was pretty much slightly positive. Whenever we talk about selling an option, like the short put, the 335, it's going to get a slightly negative, but it's not a ton. So that's what we were kind of saying before. It's, it's kind of like you want to play a higher upside potential, slightly higher break even, if that's the case long call vertical. If you said, I want a lower break even, okay? And I want to have the greater probability of being right, short put vertical. So in this meta example, we're going to sell, let's verify something, okay? Now, the reason why we did the 335, 330 is we want to kind of compare like to like. But wonder if you said, I am not comfortable in selling a 335 that is so close to the current stock price. Well, we don't have to. Take the knowledge of what we talked about last week, which is whatever strike we sell, that's where we're willing to be a buyer, okay? Now, the comment from Eva is about changing the color of the screen. So let's kind of do something for just a second. How do you change the color of the screen? Click on that gear. We're going to go to uh, application settings. Let's look and see if we can do look and feel. Okay. And let's go maybe like a light color. Now, this is important to kind of bring up. Okay. So everyone kind of might be a little different in terms of eyes, things like that. If you are, hey, change the color, right? So let's do this for Eva. It won't be fair uh, if Eva can't see it. And I, I feel sad. So let's do this. Let's go down to the 335, excuse me, three from 335 to 325. 325, strike, bid six, ask 605. Okay. Now, we're going to buy the put below that. Okay? So there it is. Selling the 325, buying the 320. Now, this kind of comes back to, in this case, is, well, how much can you risk? Well, if we said like before, we could risk $1,500, well, that would mean that we would be doing multiple contracts. Well, if you do multiple contracts, you have multiple commissions. If you want to have less commissions, which I think many people might consider, they might say, James, I'm going to open this up to the 315, but we want to verify, assume nothing, that if we look at the 315s, do we have open interest there as well? Okay, so 325, 315, there's the credit. Now, if you said, James, I was only gonna risk $500 anyway, then you might not widen out that bid ass spread because you'd just be doing one contract. Confirm and send. Now, what you're now gonna notice is if we said we we're gonna do $1,500, we can really take it up to about how many contracts? Two contracts. And if we did two contracts, given a potential $1,500 of a maximum loss, there it is. So guys and gals, let me kind of tell you, I've been doing this for 25 years. And what's the difference between investors? When we talk about investors, people talk about relative strength all the time. But if we asked and said, if we could look inside their portfolios and said, let me see what's in that portfolio, the stocks a lot of times that they have in their portfolio, are not currently relative strength, okay? Now, we are not collectors of stocks or options. We are saying, what are you doing for me now? Not what are you doing for me when we got in, what are you doing for me now? We are trying to actually have the stocks and option positions that are showing the relative strength now. If they are not showing relative strength, compared to the index and sector over about probably about a two-week period, we're saying buy, 
buy. There is no attachment. You either put out or you get out. Okay. Now, so if we start to see these stocks drop down below the 10-day moving averages, they're really, it's a really good sign that we're losing momentum. That's just when you say the put out or get out. What do you mean by that? You're either putting out the relative strength or you're not. Okay. Our patience level is two weeks. Okay. If after two weeks we don't see that relative strength, we're going to look and see across the street is there something else that is showing strength. Okay. Now, what we're going to do in this case is we're going to send the order. Okay. Now, there it is. Now, why are we cheating? Now, James, kind of let's let's kind of see something for just a second, okay? If we pulled up, let's say, where would I see if Meta is showing relative strength? Well, pretty simple. Let's go to that little test tube right there. Edit studies. Okay, fine. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna type in relative strength. Okay. So we just clicked on the test tube. Click on relative, click on relative strength. And then you can specify what you want the benchmark to be, okay? Now, it defaults to the S&P. If we said, look, we want to see something at least as strong as the S&P or stronger, let's just use this as a benchmark. But we can also change this to something else, like a sector, et cetera. Let's apply. Now, what you're now going to see down below is we're going to see this line, this red line right there. That's the benchmark of the S&P, okay? The blue line is the performance of Meta compared to the benchmark. The benchmark is flat, the benchmark, okay? Now, let me kind of show you a different stock to kind of show you a different example. What about an NVIDIA? Well, in video, what you're going to notice is for a while, that blue line has been increasing, 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 increasing relative to the benchmark. The benchmark, whatever you choose, is flat, okay? Now, if you said, well, James, I'm in stocks like Procter & Gamble, and I, my portfolio has been stinking lately. I know it has, because that's been below the benchmark. So you got to ask yourself, why are you in what you're in? I'm in Procter & Gamble because I want the dividend. So if you said that, you're not playing relative strength. And, and, and that might be okay for you. As long as you're okay with that. You just have to understand that sometimes it's not always going to be the case that the stocks that you pick from an income perspective have relative strength. Now, if you said, well, James, I've been looking at Simon Property Group, and that's been something where the relative strength has been underperforming. Remember, this is a relative strength of the Simon Property Group. We're looking up at the benchmark. If you're buying something below the benchmark, we better be seeing, okay, that in that, that, that performance starting to narrow relative to the benchmark. So James, are, we, are you saying that we can never buy something below the benchmark? I didn't say that, but it better be closing in on the benchmark. We better be seeing this blue line getting closer and closer and closer and closer to the benchmark. So you're buying something that has been underperforming that might start to perform in line with the benchmark and or start to outperform the benchmark. So here's what I need you to do. I want you to look at what's in your portfolio. I want you to have really a come to meet, come to come to James meeting with yourself. Dragon Rider 108, you're going to have a meeting with yourself. Wiley, you're going to have a meeting with yourself. Mike, you're going to have a meeting with yourself. Tech FC1, you're going to have a meeting with self. You're going to look and see what's in your portfolio. And I want you to give an honest, candid, brass tack, unfiltered. Why do you own what you own? What is your real strategy? If you had to sum it up in one word, two words, max, okay, what is your portfolio really founded on? If you said income or dividend, okay, fine. Ours is focus on relative strength, and we use stocks and options to try to capture those gains. There's no love affair with any stock. You either put out or get out. Put out means that you trend, 
Put out means that you're having outperformance relative to the index and sector. Put out actually means that you're making, you're still having a uh, price above the 10. If it's not, goodbye. Okay. Our patience level is two weeks. If we start to see that they're falling off or falling down below the 10, buy. Okay. What you'll probably find is when you're kind of like non-emotional like that, you stop getting tied up in positions that aren't really making any money, which you got to ask yourself the question, why did you get in? To be a collector or to be an investor who's collecting income and or price appreciation? I think it's probably the latter, okay? So I'm out of my time here today. We did a number of trades. We talked about our focus on the Russell kind of being inverse head and shoulder potential setup. We talked about that focus probably going into year end, more on the NASDAQ. We also talked about kind of heavily talked about these two past portfolios that we've done. And we'll continue talking about the relative strength. I want you to look at your stocks and ask yourself, do I own relative strength? Might I switch to other areas that are stronger? Okay. Now, uh, with that said, we'll uh, stay tuned for our next class coming up right at the top of the hour. Uh, also, remember that when you look at examples, there are many examples of relative strength. So if you say you can't find some, I would doubt that. We talk about marketing conditions. We talk about strategies uh, to, to really enhance uh, the likelihood of potentially making money, okay? And also trying to create focus in illustrating strategies to apply what we're trying to focus on. Also remember that in our examples, we talked about using options. Options are not suitable for all investors. If you'd like to keep coming back to a class where you could actually see me do example trades with this focus and then track the returns over the year, no excuses. I don't want to hear anything about excuses, okay? We're going to track the performance over time, and we want to see the transparency of those trades, good ones and bad ones over time. No excuses, okay? If you like that, well, we'll see you here same time next week, and we'll talk about these trades. Now, also remember that uh, when we talk about a calendar coming up next, okay, we'll be having this class uh, from Barbara Armstrong, Getting Started with Options, and also stay tuned for her class and other classes throughout the day as well. Thank you, Cameron. Thanks to all of you. And with that said, take care. Bye-bye.